Hey everybody, this is Rick here at the Comic Wow Studios. This is your wow factor. I am here with Trevor Price. He is the creator, writer, producer of the Kulapari <laughs> and Army of Frogs. Yeah, I am. How are you? Thanks for coming in. Absolutely, man. I live down the street, so it was good. Yeah, perfect. Thank God for that. Yeah, right? <laughs> that is great. <laughs> so, Trevor, most people are going to know you from your time as an NFL football player. Yeah. But now you have branch into your second career. Technically your third, because you did some produ uh, music yeah. production. Yeah, for yeah. A that was bad. Yeah, was it? That was awful. Okay, well, let's not even talk about it. All right, let's go right into yeah, the, the whole writer-producer yeah. creator yeah. aspect, because we are a comic book company here, and in that, we want to know yeah. what's going on in that, that room. So what inspired you to come up with this whole Kulapari? It's actually a really, a really bonker story, because like everybody else, when Planet Earth came out, Mm -hmm. I was transfixed on it, right. right? And so while that was happening, while I'm watching this, and I'm going, I've never seen um, this part of, uh, I think, not human nature, but the part of, of, of li the life forms, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it became, um, that is cool, what can happen? I remember there was one scene where in the Amazon rainforest a frog kept jumping through the tree frogs and they'd shoot them in slow motion right. and that looked like Superman to me. Sure. And I just never forgot that. And then when 300 came out, because this is around the same time, 300 right. came out, um, that, that scene where Leonidas is standing over the rocks and all the Persian shoulders are coming, for some reason I just saw scorpions. Nice. So I was like, flying frog. Persian scorpions. Let's see what we got here. And literally, it was an accident that happened one night at midnight. Okay. And those two thoughts kind of collided because what, what was happening was I was doing a Hollywood writing thing and I was trying to sell these ideas and they weren't really going anywhere. Okay. Some of the, the animated ones did. I, got, mm -hmm. I sold a show to Disney. I sold another one. I sold two shows to Disney, Disney Channel. Um, but I really wanted my own kind of action, you know, sure. boys, girls. Mm -hmm comic book kind of IP. Sure. And those two things collided and this became the happy accident that color part is. And I love that. Now, that kind of leads me into the why. Why when you would you go from something such as where you're an NFL football player, you're right. you're just a powerhouse on yeah, the field yeah. and now you're you're writing and uh, you're creating this kind of stuff. Why why did that transition occur? It 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 wasn't a why. It's always been that. Okay. I, I used to write as a kid when I was a kid. Oh, okay. I was a really good artist as a kid. When I was when I was I never forget. It. I was in fourth or fifth grade. I used to draw. I used to take small pictures and draw them big, almost to scale, as best as you could as a ten-year-old. You sure. know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, but I hit puberty, and all of a sudden I couldn't draw, and neither could I run either. Like I just hit, and I just shot up six inches on the summer right. and lost all motor function. Sure. But that didn't change my imagination. Right. And what I used to tell people all the time is, I I grew up as a hyperactive kid. My parents wouldn't say that, <laughs> but. But I was hyperactive. I could not sit still. And the times I did have to sit still, right, I couldn't go outside and play soccer or play football or play basketball or play sports, my brain worked at a, that same, either my body was moving or my brain was moving. Sure. Right? So that same hyperactiveness made me ultra creative. Okay. You know what I, I mean? So I, so I used to write my own little Batman comics and I used to, you know, dream up things that I, I didn't know how to do. Sure. And that's how I got into making music. Okay. Because I was always, I always had to be doing something right. physically, or or emotionally or mentally, to combat that constant sugar rush that was part of my body. You know okay. what I mean? Absolutely. So it, it wasn't th that was easy. Sure. The transition was <clears throat> much easier than people think. Okay. Now, as far as everybody uh, who maybe have watched the Netflix series on this, it's all started from a series of young adult books, yeah. a, th a trilogy, yep. the Kulapari and Army of Frogs, yep. uh, Kulapari and the, um, the Rainbow, Rainbow Serpent, yep. and then the last one, I can't Amphibian's End. Amphibian's End, okay. <laughs> um, which all three of those combined yeah. makes the first season yeah. of the show. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, so I came up with Kulapari, and it was first called Poison. Okay. I had a bunch of weird names. It was called Frog Brigade and called Poison all these things, and I remember somebody said, "Yeah, had an epic name." So I called a, um, a a professor of Aboriginal culture in Toronto University okay. in Canada, yeah. and he gave me. I said, "How do you say poison in Aboriginal culture?" Because it, it took place in Australia and right. outback, and I was like, 
well, that's cool. <laughs> what, right. what, you know, which culture has Disney not used yet? Sure. They will not use that one because that one is dark. dark. It's very dangerous. Sure. And it, is, it is filled with violence <laughs> and, and really weird things. So um, he gave me like probably 20 different pronunciations for it, 20 different ways to say okay. it. And Kulapari was the only one I could pronounce. So I was like, well, it's called Kulapari. So I, I, uh, I wrote it up. I went and found Sanford Green. I found him online. Mm -hmm. I found him online, funny enough, on a Saturday night in my hotel before we played Pittsburgh. Oh wow! I was looking up. We had like I had like a long five-hour break in between, you know, meetings in the game or leaving the bus for the game, and I was like, I'm gonna look up a comic book artist to <laughs> find the best one, right. and I found him. So I got the art done. Um, that took a long time. Right. That took a developing art style. Um, he, he got it wrong the first five or six sure. times. So finally he got it right. Once he got one character right, the rest of them were easy. Okay. Um, and what was that one character? What was that first character? The first character was Bernu. Bernu? Okay. Yeah, so I, I was like, look, we're going to do the one with the mo Like, you know, he's my version of Wolverine. He's a mohawk. And, and what I did was I gave him real frogs. Okay. I gave him images of real frogs. So every frog you see... Every enemy you see is based on a real image. Sure. So there is a frog that looks like his skin, like his skin pattern, skin mm -hmm. tone, um, looks just like that. Nice. So, <clears throat> so I gave him. He he did the art. I wrote the story. I wrote a treatment up. I wrote a a, a proposal, a TV proposal. Okay. And my agents at the time at ICM shopped it around Cartoon Network. So yes, and bought it. Okay. Cartoon Network or Cooler Party for a couple of years, but also Abrams, the book company. Okay. They loved it, so I did two different things at once. Nice. Um, so by the time Abrams published it, Cartoon Network was like, hey, we're going to make Color Party into a comedy like the regular show. Mm. I was like, no, the hell you're not. <laughs> right. So I, they gave it back to me. Perfect. Yeah. So, that, so that's how it became the books. And what, right. what once the fast forward, you know, Netflix thing happened, and pitching a TV show in general, mm. and they were really smart because I wanted to do one season per book. Okay. And... Animation takes so long. They said, by the time we get to doing season three of this, those books would be 10 years old. Right. He was like, they were like, compress them into one story, and then if we make a second one or third one, write something right. specifically just for us. Okay. And it, it, it made absolute sense, because I'd be working on the Rainbow Serpent right now, right. and I'm just like, <laughs> there's, there's, there's a stack of color part papers this long, and I'm like, Rainbow Serpent's down here. Right. What about all this other stuff? Sure. You know? I also would think too that when when you're writing something, the the amount of detail you have to describe your scenarios, your settings, um, is lost in, you know, from a novel it shrinks down because that, that's just art. Absolutely, and you don't have to it's, write about it. Oh it's my there. gosh, it shrinks a lot. We, yeah. we lost a lot because it, because there's only 13 episodes, and that doesn't give you that gives you four, four, and four, but then you have one extra, <laughs> and it's sure. like what it happens here. So the the Netflix series follows the stories of the books, but there were certain things we couldn't do. Like, okay. we just couldn't animate them. You know okay. what I mean? It, 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 was just, it sounds weird, but you couldn't animate 10-minute conversations. <laughs> you, right. know, you know what right. I mean? You just can't do that. So, um, but to an extent, I, I had to break down the books and find those places I could do something different. No, Absolutely. it's my story. It wasn't, it was, I mean... Sure. I, we could have animated the ten minute conversations, but I don't know which twelve. It years may old, not have been. It may not have been captured. No, right. no, no, no. Now, th speaking of uh, the Netflix series, we have have the uh, trailer mm -hmm. for those of you that have not seen the show yet. Check out this trailer, and when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more on the Netflix series. Awesome. It was an age of war. The frog tribes were driven back into the Amphibolands by the crushing attacks of the scorpions. The veil still protects us, for now. Nobody's born a hero, little warrior, but you can do anything if you try hard enough. It's time for battle, not banter. Not the gooseberries! We don't need warriors, Daryl. The veil keeps us safe. The Kulapari died to keep us safe. You will never be a Kulapari! There is more to power than brute strength. Ah! 
Endervale falls, and the Amphibolans are mine. Only the son of a fallen Kulapari thinks our world still needs a warrior. So we're back. Um, we're back here with uh, Trevor Price, a the writer, creator, producer of the Kulapari. Thanks for tuning in and watching us. Um, one of the things I wanted to go into next, now that we're talking about the Netflix series, mm -hmm. is the characters themselves. Yep. You really get invested in them, and I want to. I know from speaking to other writers and creators that they they bring people from their life. Right. Into their characters. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, inspire certain characters. Who, from your life, inspires such characters as, like, uh, the main character, Daryl? Yeah. Um, yeah. Which I, I found also very interesting. Again, in the research on this, Daryl meaning blue sky. Yeah. And That's then, in the, word. and yeah. he becomes the blue sky king. Yep. Which is so awesome. So, he was, he was, that was his, so all the names of the characters, can't, I'm not doing it now going forward, but all names were, were Aboriginal names. Okay. They're almost like Aboriginal gods. Okay. They all have a name that's very, very conducive to their personality. So Bernu means warrior. Okay. Daryl Daryl is the name of a blue sky god. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Lord Marmu Marmu means death and destruction. The word means death and destruction. Wow. So it just it just kind of made sense to me. And so right. that was a deep dive. I want up sure. I, like I want up in this Aboriginal rabbit hole that I could not get out <laughs> of for about four years. Right. I just you know kept digging. Um, but there was nobody in general that. I, I think it's because my life at the time was filled with, with professional sports, sure. and those personalities are kind of all the same. Okay. You know what I mean? It's like A types. A, it, it's, it's A types, but it's also B and C types. But is, but we all do the same as I think. Sure. You know what I mean? We all go to practice the same day. You ask any baseball player, baseball player, any professional athlete, because it's a job. Your personality is getting your job done so sure. you can go home and do something else right. and just not get hurt. You right. know what I mean? Absolutely. So there was there was nothing in that. I, I will say, other stuff I've worked on, um, <clears throat> and modeled after my son or after my daughters or whatever, whatever, mm -hmm. but I think I tried to pick, I tried to find great character traits in all of them so I could say, okay, mm -hmm. um, this is going to be your journey through the next 10 years. Sure. This is going to be your journey. And, and it is playing out for 10 years. Wow. You know what I mean? yeah. That's awesome. Like, I know that a lot of people that are watching the show, watching the series, reading the books, mm -hmm. they're going to identify with the character. Of course. And uh, my character I identify with the most is, is Pontu. <laughs> or, uh, or he, um, as the muscle medic. Yeah, the um, muscle medic. The reason it, it, I say that is because I was in the military. I did, oh, I nice. did 20 years, yeah. and I was a medic. No, there and you go. I was there you go. You are Ponto. And I was a, just giant. You are Ponto, literally, I, yeah. 100%. Yeah, I, that, I, I made him for you. I, totally, I, thank you. <laughs> and I totally <laughs> identify with that character, and I know that like um, I have friends that I could say that Koba, uh, uh, yep, the Koba, uh, yeah, is mm -hmm. one of Kulapar. Absolutely, one yeah. of my favorite characters. Yeah. And I have a question about, sure. about her and Daryl. Yeah, you want to you, you want to hear the crazy thing before you even ask that question? Uh -huh. um, the next Kulapari novel. This is so funny. That's so funny. You say that. <clears throat> the next Kulapari novel uh, is not being written by me. Okay. And it's called Warflower, and it's her book. Nice. So she has her own story. Okay. She has her own, like, what happens to her post um, post all of this. Okay. Because, you know, everything, everything from now on starts, like, right after that happens. Mm -hmm. So her and Daryl are the, are the, are the main um, antagonists. The protagonist, protagonist. Mm -hmm. in the book. So, because the reason I ask that is, and I, this is a small spoiler. I don't want to spoil everything, <laughs> obviously, because I want you guys to go watch this. In the very end, mm -hmm. her and Daryl are holding hands up on the animated series. And I, I just was like, please let this be a thing. I know it sounds kind of corny it and is, stuff for is, a, a, a grown-ass man, grown man, man to be like, please let this be a thing. It but is, I absolutely invested in those it characters. Is, it is a thing, and wait till you see what happens okay. in that thing. Okay, awesome. It's a, it's a thing, all right. Cool. Might not end the way you like it to, but it is a it thing. It may not, but I, yeah, I, I like it. It is a, it I is like a it thing. They have, their, they have their own story. A lot of the stuff that um, you had also mentioned uh, is... This couldn't be a Disney thing because of the out, it being an Outback and Outback. As anybody who has read or seen any of these shows that you mentioned earlier knows that it's the, one of the deadliest places on earth. <laughs> everything and, there will kill you. Yeah, everything, literally. <laughs> everything. <laughs> um, 
and that is reflected in the shit. Yeah, that there, you know, you didn't hold back on. Nope. People will die, or yep. characters will die. They characters will die. you invest in, they will die. Will, will, will die. Absolutely, uh, war is hell. Yeah, you can't, you can't. I made a decision very early on, and uh, I'll tell you a story. But I made the decision early on. If I'm going to make something about poisonous frogs, which the most deadliest animal on the planet is a frog, it's the golden dart frog, right. um, that are fighting poisonous scorpions and outback, it can't be zoinks and boinks. It can't Absolutely. be. It can't be, oh, take them out. Mm -hmm. It has to be, you know, like Chief Oba said, a body wrecked with pain and death. It's not war stories. This mm -hmm. is, if you're going to do it, do it correctly. Absolutely. You know what I mean? You have to, I, I tried to show some um, respect for what those animals really are. Sure. And if they did grow to be human-sized and talk, mm -hmm. this is what they would do. Absolutely. They would fight to the death. There's no question. No question. It. So um, I... I made a decision earlier on, and and so the last book in the series, Amphibian's End, when I turned it in, because Abrams, when I signed my publishing deal, it was for one book. It wasn't okay. for three. Okay. As I started writing the first book, I said, okay, we'll do this. We'll do the other two. Nice. So they had no idea what was coming. Oh wow. Whatever they got is what they got, and then when they got to the third, when they got the third book, Amphibian's End, they got the manuscript. They hated it. Really? They were like, you can't do this. I said, oh, yes, I can. And if you don't put out this, you'll put out nothing. Wow. So, and they, and <clears throat> by the time they got into it, they were like, we love it. Right. And then the cover, and then I had Sanford do the cover, and I was like, you know, it is it is Exodus. <laughs> you Absolutely. know what I mean? It is broken. It is, it is not a hero that wins. You know right. what I mean? He's, our main character, has been he's been beat to hell, right. and the frogs lose. And they hated the cover. <laughs> right. They hated everything. But then after they kind of saw what I was, what, where you're going? With where I'm going, and yeah. kind of how I tell stories. Mm -hmm. That became everybody's favorite book. Yeah. I, I, again, have, having not read the novels, which yeah. I absolutely must, because I know that the, there are details well, in the a books. Lot. A, a lot, especially with the Rainbow in. Serpent thing, because mm -hmm. the Rainbow Serpent thing is a real thing. Like, that's okay. Aboriginal guy. Yeah. I, I, when I again yeah. doing the research for this interview, no, yeah. uh, I looked it all up, and I, at first I was like, "Is this Quetzalcoatl from the Mexican?" Yeah, right. Yeah, Quetzalcoatl. That's yeah. how you say it. No, nope, it's not Quetzalcoatl. And I was like, that's "Is that cool it?" And I was like, "No." And then I saw yeah. the rock art yeah. of the Rainbow Serpent. I'm like, "Oh, it's real. It's real. Yeah. This is all I, part of the funny true thing, Aboriginal." Yeah. So that was again the happy accident. Nice was. Stumbling to Aboriginal culture, so a lot of stuff that, that people think I'm making up, mm -hmm. I'm not making up. <laughs> you know, the rainbow right. serpent is this. Nice. You know, the poisonous animals do this. You right. know, the, the the fable of the scorpion and the frog, which you know a lot of people know, and so like I go talk to the kids they don't know that scorpions and frogs are natural enemies. Right. You know what I mean? This is how turtles behave. This is so there's science in it in a sense that I took the the parts of Aboriginal culture I wanted, and I'm actually taking more mm -hmm. as I go forward and um, making it something wholly original. Because yeah. if you haven't heard of it before, it's original to you. Absolutely. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. Yes. So if, if it's new to you, it's new. Right. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I, I, uh, I stumbled in, like literally walked into this backwards and wound up, and I'm not kidding. I, I wish I could say, uh, you know, it was fully thought out, but as I got layers and layers, I kept going. I kept finding more cool things. Right. You know what I mean? The third book wasn't supposed to be called Amphibian's End. It was going to be called something else. And, like, my publisher, who's a really smart lady, um, Susan, she said, no, give it an animal name because mm -hmm. the first two are Army of Frogs. Right. Like, an Army of Frogs is how you say pl frogs in plural. Right. You have to say this. Right. You see three frogs, that's an Army of Frogs. Army of frogs. You, know, okay. you know, the Rainbow Serpent, you can't call them the third one Journey to the Big Red Rock. Right. <laughs> so I called it Amphibian's End and... They were like, okay, did you go? You're going a little too far. But uh, uh, I, I, I enjoy it. I, I, I'm really proud of it. And, right. um, and, and you absolutely should be. Yeah, uh, thank you. It's, I'm, it's, I'm, it's gaining I'm, a fan base. Speaking of yeah. fan bases on this, uh, Parkville Middle, one of my friends is a teacher there. And when oh, yeah. I mentioned that it's on Facebook that I was going to be doing this interview, he's like, my students love their uh, Trevor's books. That, oh, really? So tell, them I said, oh, tell them I said, oh, tell them I I'll tell them to contact you. And I'll, right. uh, are they close to here? Uh, Parkville. Yeah, so just Parkville. Yeah, I'll go yeah. talk to them. Nice. I have nothing to do. There you go. I actually, um, have, a, no. I actually have a lot to do, but I'll go anyway. <laughs> uh, so we talked about some heroes, um, and you have a, a, a large list of heroes. But now let's talk about the villains. In this. <laughs> You've got Lord Marmu, Commander yeah. Pigo, yeah. Queen Jara, yeah. and Falga, yeah. her apprentice. Yeah. 
but my favorite is Kalara. Captain the Kalara. The, the, the mercenary. mercenary. Yeah. I don't know why I, I kind of, I, I zoned in on him. Um, um, he's, he's amazing yeah. in that as a mercenary, you know, if someone will pay him a better price, <laughs> he'll <laughs> get in line I have, with them. I have, I, have I, no, I have no acquaintances with you people. Right. Are you animal? No, yeah, I don't. This is a job. That's a job. You are, he says, a you are a job. Right. You know what I mean? And so <clears throat> I, uh, I, again, in the storytelling, I said, okay, what can I bring to it that I've never seen? Sure. That I've never seen. Okay. Where, where you know, I, we fight for the highest bidder. We are not a part of a part of this conflict. Right. We fight whoever will pay pay us, right. which is quite honestly, what a professional athlete is. Sure. You play. You like. I grew up a New York Giants fan. Okay. You know, there's plenty of people on plenty of teams that are playing for the hated rival of the team they grew up rooting for. Right. But guess what? They're the ones paying you. <laughs> so you have to. So I guess right. if there's anything anybody in any in this world that I can relate to with him because I am a, I was a mer- I, sure. all professional athletes are mercenaries. Are mercenaries. You know what You're I mean? You're here first, Jets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Here it is. So it, that's what you are. You, I mean, I played for the Ravens. I, you know, I loved it, but I, I, I'm not from Boston. I'm from Florida. Right. You know what I mean? So Kalara speaks to people in that way, and I think he's just a really, really cool character. He's an absolutely cool character. Yeah. And one of the things I, uh, again, I don't want to spoil anything, but the interaction <laughs> that Daryl – Kalara and the Skink Warriors yeah. have, it kind of gave me the feeling that there was a respect 100%. amongst them, 100%. because I think Daryl understood, oh, I get it. Yeah, I, I, get, mean, it. I, I get it. I get it. I get it. As long as I, pay, as long as I give you this, um, it's all, you know, it, and that's what I think, again, the storytelling, you know, trying to do it differently, because I figured out very early, if I try to tell the same story everybody else is telling, I'm dead in the water. Sure. You know what I mean? So it's one thing if it looks cool and does this and does this, but when people get into the story, when, when kids understand the story, when, when, when anybody that likes that, that watches the first two episodes mm-hmm. and goes, oh, there's more, there's, okay, this is getting deep. And, and I, I love Twitter. I'm not a big social media guy, everybody. I'm really not. You know, I, <laughs> but when it first came out, when I started getting the, there was one tweet I'll never forget. It was like, why watch Game of Thrones when Killer Party's out? <laughs> I'm just sure. like, you know, like, okay, I didn't, I didn't see that coming, but I tried to do something unexpected in that sense with sure. Kalar, with Absolutely. all the characters, but Absolutely. especially Kalar, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? And going forward, he he takes a hard le- I mean it's it is going to be pretty spectacular. Okay, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Now, TCM. when when you're going in you're out there shopping this around mm-hmm. uh, as far as getting the animation stuff, you could have went in any direction. You could yeah. have gone to any studio, animation yeah. studio and said, "This is my project. Let's mm-hmm. make this happen." Yeah. Yeah. But you chose Splash Entertainment. Yeah. And the animation style is Flash mm-hmm. animation. Mm-hmm. Why did you choose mm-hmm. that over any other? Um, I think the big thing was I chose them because they loved it as much as I did, okay. as much as I, I as much as I do. Sure. And they felt they felt like a, a lot of studios could have could have would have done like you said anybody would have done it, but sure. they done it as a job. Absolutely. And they were like, no, we love this. Like we okay. we think you have stumbled upon the next big boys IP. Okay. And I was like, okay, we well, are hard. All right. Now, how do we make this? Right? Absolutely. And so the physical animation itself, the physical animation, actual drawing itself, is done in Canada at a place called Cartoon Conrad. Okay. And I think they're making something for Mike Judge right now. Like nice. since Color Party came out, they have gone like this, and now right. it's going to be very expensive. I mean, I've seen that they did some stuff in the past. Yeah, but now, but nothing like this. No, no. We just yeah. see what they're doing next. Okay. <laughs> like they, they, I mean, I was like, hey, has anything changed? They rattled it all off, and I was like, okay, everything's wow. changed. Um, Good. But the reason we did flash animation is because. The effects. Mm-hmm. So, um, the part where you know the the, the explosions at the mm-hmm. end and the the poison drops from the sky and all that kind of thing. Sure. It's it's not even as cause effect. It looks better when you start um, adding effects to it. Okay. You know what I mean? And then the rock falls and stuff like that. Right. So that became the reason why we didn't flash it. Plus. We could layer it a little different. Okay. I, had to, I had to learn all this. Sure. I had to learn all this because I had never made anything in my right. life. I had written a book, and that was such a steep learning curve. Mm-hmm. But now I, I gave myself a green light. It's like, okay, you make an animated show. So you learn that business very, very quickly. So sure. that's why we did it in Flash. It was partly because of the effects mm-hmm. and the layering that we could do with the, with the characters. And I think Flash wise, um, the mouths move a little better. You know right. what I mean? Unless, unless you have 
Family Guy's budget, which is four <laughs> million dollars an episode, sure. which is you know would have been great. But even then, would it had looked would it had looked much different than what we had? No. Sure, I I, yeah. I see in the Flash animation uh, process that the colors pop. Way differently. Way like, different. Like when the Kula party the, themselves when they, when, they, when they tap into the poison, yeah, it, go, it they looks glow. way different. I mean, it looks it looks uh, way it's, different it's could be because it's a it's an effect rather than coloring. Sure. You know what I mean? So it looks it. That was the other thing too. It looked. I thought it looked better. Sometimes it moves, um, not quite the way I want it to. Mm -hmm. um, but pleasing to the eye when you when you still frame it right. and you just look at that frame, it looks better. It looks high def. Right. You know what I mean? Even it's low. Even most low def. Because it's flash and the way we made it, mm -hmm. you freeze a frame. It looks like you're looking at a purposely drawn twenty-hour picture. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Now, when you think of when it, so again, when you're doing the production on this and you're and you're having to now identify a voice to the characters, <laughs> and I, the list of voice actors you have is is yeah. amazing. Yeah. Uh, from Philomar, Keith David, Mark yeah. Hamill, yeah. Uh, Lacey, uh, Skywalker, Trevor, uh, Josh Keaton, Charlie Josh Adler, Gillette. Wendy uh, Malik. Yeah, what? Josh was great. Um, that was that, okay. That was another thing. The other part of learning curve is they send you a bunch of budget company production company sends you an email <clears throat> with all these clips okay. of, of voices, right? Um, but none of them are talking like your characters, and none of them are saying your sides. So you had to you had to be like, okay, I think that sounds like Daryl. Sure. I don't know. Certain people you just let come and do whatever they want. <clears throat> Mark Hamill showed up, and <laughs> and they were like, okay, Mark. Do it, and he went in age of war. And you're like, hey, perfect, we're yeah. good, <laughs> you're good. <laughs> and he, yeah, all right. And Keith David shows up, and he goes, oh, he, great. The rest yeah. of them, you kind of have to point and choose and sure. kind of make. So that was that was a different experience itself. But I will tell you, when you when I heard my character speak for the first time, that was uh, pretty cool because Mark did Ogier's voice, and that's not right. the voice I had in my it wasn't. Head. Not at all. Oh. He showed up and he's, I was like, well, was I, like, he's in the studio, he's in the booth, and I'm like, do I tell him it's wrong? They were like, no. No, you do, you do not. <laughs> I said, well, you are not hold you here. You know what I mean? And like he did Ponto as well. And Ponto wasn't what I had in my mind right. at all. I was like, that doesn't sound right. I was like, well, it's Mark Hamill. That's right. Skywalker and he has a beard, so let me. But it was funny because I went and I looked at the IMDb and yeah. I'm like, okay, who are doing these voice? Because, yeah. you know, and this is again before I even reached out to you. Because yeah. I, I, I like to do this research where I go and I'm like, who, who's doing this voice? Because old Jer, I was like, man, that, that, that sounds, sounds really like a joker, familiar. doesn't it? That sounds really familiar <laughs> to me. So I went in and when I saw it was Mark Hamill, yeah. again, on IMDb, you don't know who Mark Hamill is doing. Right. You have to actually go to like the Wikipedia yeah. or one of the other yeah. pages. And I'm like, but as soon as I saw it, I yeah, knew it was that was old Jir. Yeah. I did not know that he did Ponto in the first yeah, yeah. half of that series. Yeah. I, I, actually, <clears> at first, I didn't know he was doing Ponto because I showed up for the old Jir recording. Right. Um, I had to come back home, and they're like, yeah, he's going to do Ponto as well. Nice. I was like, great, send me what it sounds like. you know. And he, he went in this Western thing, and I was just like, yeah, man, it, it works. The one Josh... Keaton was 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 weird because what happens in the show, and you know it's a show, is Daryl's voice changes and his performance changes and he goes from being a naive kind of kid who right. wants to play fight into being beat to hell. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's so the maturity in him, you know, he starts talking slower and lower and mm -hmm. it's kinda like focused. He focused and I'm like, he's like, Everybody I know is going to die. Right. You know what I mean? And some some of my friends already have died. Right. So he he speaks. He, so that took a little voice to write. Then Charlie was a director. Charlie Adler plays Starscream right. and everything. Everything. Right? So, <laughs> but he's also a voice director. Okay. So he's in the booth yelling at people. And Wendy Malick mm. and Keith came at the same time and did their lines together. Oh wow! That was bonkers because right. it, because they're sitting there and they have their have their scripts. Right. And it was like watching it was like watching a play. Oh as nice. They sat there, you know what I mean. Mark kind of did his thing on his time, mm -hmm. you know what I mean. But Josh and um, Josh did his when he wanted to, and Jesse um, Purnell he did like four or five voices. I He's the best voice actor I've ever seen. Right. I've only seen 10 of them. Right. <laughs> the ones that worked on my thing. Phil was great. Phil Lamar was, he plays Kalara. And, yes, he does. And, and <laughs> when he came in, when he came in, he did like <clears throat> 10 different voices. Wow. And I was just like, I was like, no, that's too superhero-y. You know right. what I mean? That's too villainy. And we're going to have a villain, Lord Marvel. I said, make him kind of, 
slimy and swarthy kind of like yeah like swashbuckler yeah yeah kind of. like yeah, and he, he did it I was like perfect nice. you know what I mean so anyway that was that was my experience that, now post the Netflix rage that's going on right now, <laughs> and, it's, and I think it is going on because a lot of people are yeah. um, you know finding it yeah they may they not really are they're, they're, yeah. they're finding it and when they yeah. find it they stick to it they love it yeah. and they're giving it a lot of praise yeah um the follow-up, yeah. we know that Netflix has um, called for a second season, mm -hmm. but you did a, a comic book, uh, The Kulapari Heritage, yeah. which came out as a four-issue limited series, yeah. right? And is now going to be in trade paperback, which is trade paperback, yeah. at your local comic book stores yeah. on February 15th. Yep. Yeah. Um, the storyline there, that yeah. gapping storyline, yeah. uh, was this something that you had already like pre-planned? Everything, or? everything's been pre-planned. Okay. Because what you, because what I, what you can't do, especially with animation, is go back. Right. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, it, it, for instance, uh, Star Wars. I always, always reference Star Wars as in, in a New Hope, and they kind of rejigged that backwards. It's kind of like we can put a couple things in it to make it connect to the other movies. You sure. know what I mean? Can't do the animation. Right. So I couldn't. For instance, the big thing that this whole world kind of rolls around the poison scrolls. And okay. there's four of them. There's one for each poison. Right. And those four poison scrolls give these poisonous animals their their powers, okay. their, their power to tap their poison or whatever. Um, so I couldn't mention that in the books without really telling that story. So what I did is I tried to mention it in the fourth, in the last book, mm -hmm. um, and then have Bernu go back to the Amphibolance looking for one. Okay. And when he gets there, he finds out that the biggest thing he finds out is, I know I spend three books in an entire series saying there's only four color party left. Right. That's a lie. There's a lot more. There's, it <laughs> seems like there's. Well, there's you have a, Daryl's little. There's just three. So, so, so the next time you hear or see, I'll give you this. Next cool. time you see color party move and talk, it's them three, okay. and they're grown up. Nice. They, they are, they are something else. <laughs> Their colors are pretty, pretty cool. Nice. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, so he finds another Kalapari frog named Wilka, um, and her power is when she goes poison, she can make copies of herself. Right. You know what I mean, and she also he also finds that there's some um, nefarious um, other characters going on. And what I and what I don't do is try to like Queen Jara was was always meant to be a big main villain. Right. But I thought it more interesting to have Marmu kill her. Than spoiler. Sure. So um, I'm not bringing her back. Okay. Marmu might come back. <laughs> he might. He might. Know. Yeah, but right. um, um, so it's, it's, it's that, you know, when Bernu winds up going back to Amphibolands, I think by going back to where the destroyed home, he opens up the world because he's not the only one there. Okay. And once he gets there, he finds out there is more to this poison scroll thing than we thought. Okay. But at the very same time, there's things going on here, things going on here, right. and this new land. The new land is supposed to be all of the species put together. Because remember, Captain Pigo, right. um, Commander Pigo, and everybody went with Daryl to the new land. Right. And so we all get there, so now we're starting over from scratch. Mm -hmm. The entire kingdom of Terra Australis is starting from scratch okay. because the amphibolans is burned to the ground. So we do have a question. One of the questions sure. goes back to um, the voice actors. Yeah. If you could have a voice actor that you, anybody you could choose, who, who is one of those voice actors you would you'd want? Oh, my God. Um, I would have, um, you know, it's funny. It's like, you, you I, I, the actor would have been more so than the voice. Sure. Like, I don't know how good John Hamm sounds as a voice actor. Okay. He, I just love John Hamm. Sure. <laughs> you know what I right. mean? Or how good how good does Jason Statham sound as a voice actor? Right. I just love Jason Statham. I think he'd be excellent. You know what I mean? Sure. So I think it'd be him. Because he, he has a unique voice. Yeah, he also would bring a little bit of that accent. Oh, he, he'd bring the well. accent, and he'd also bring... A, I, I let him curse. Nice. <laughs> I let him curse. It. Have you yourself considered getting in the in the sound booth in the I, voice? I have a I have a line in the show. Do you? Yeah, that's awful. Is it it's in awful. one it's that we so would recognize? Um, nope. <laughs> I, have, I have one line, and it's uh, they they made me do it in a sense. They're like, okay, do it so we know how you want it done. Sure. And they never replaced it. 
Oh, and I told, oh, and I, told oh, I said, I would never forgive you any of you for this. It's, <laughs> it's, I hate the sound of my voice already, and now you put it for the world to see. Uh, it's, ba- yeah. it's bad. I think your voice is, is, bad. is, is great, mm-hmm. and I think it would be fun to see you as a as a, one of the uh, the Mercs. Well, no, right. That, that's what I do. I play one of the ones in the background if I okay. could. But, yeah, but no, never. Now, um, in the in the comic, again, which is going to be out uh, February 15th at your local comic shop in mm-hmm. trade paperback form, um, you talk about scrolls. Yeah. Uh, and my question to you, and this, again, maybe a little spoiler is, they are referenced not so much as what we envision right. a scroll, right. but as a vessel. Yeah. And yeah. Um, where did you get that idea? Because I just, it, it blew be, my mind be, when, be, I, when I saw you're it. Right, because um, scrolls is too easy. Okay. It's literally. Right. And so the way I write and where I create is, I... And I and I and I I thank the audience for this, right? So, I look at the audience as being as smart, if not smarter, than I am. So, what would they expect? Sure. What would be the What would be the first thing they say? Poison scrolls is three thing, four things right. that you roll in. <clears throat> not true. You know what I mean? So, it's a respect to the audience nice. rather than is because uh, if you're gonna pick up my book and read my book, I I want to give you something that even makes you go, huh? That's enough. Sure. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It makes some people go, whoa! Right. But at, at the base, if you go, huh, you see that coming? Right. You know what I mean? Then I've done my job. Absolutely. You know what I mean? So that's where it, it, that's where it comes from. It's, you know, your first, when you come up with a name, Poison Scrolls, it's like, oh, yeah, that's cool. Then you go, no, 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 no that's not this. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So like you said, it becomes a vessel more than it is actual okay. four pieces of paper. I love it. Now, um, that that's pretty much all that's going on in the Kulapari realm right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's look to the future. Yeah. Uh, we know that Netflix has picked up season two. Uh, we know that you're delving into the comic book arena with mm-hmm. the Kulapari. Mm-hmm. Are there any other properties that you're working on that are yeah. going to be comic book format? Yeah, there's um, there's something called Foster Brassard. Okay. I think you, Diamond's putting that out. <laughs> I don't even know. I think May, actually. Mm-hmm. So Foster Brassard is um, if very, and I hate doing this, but if Kulapari is my Star Wars, Foster Brassard is my Indiana Jones. Okay. So Foster is a uh, a con man in the 1800s <clears throat> in um, in England who gets sent to the gold rush oh, to nice. go um, for the, the Queen of England sends him. She's he's about to be hung, <clears throat> and he's like, I know where gold is. So he talks his way out of being hung, okay. right? And for whatever he did in England, so they sent him to Coloma, which is doing the gold rush. There's no law. There's right. no nothing. So he shows up there. Thinking he's going to get gold, he winds up in this big conflict with a Native American demon. Oh, wow. <laughs> so oh. the whole, what the whole, <laughs> the, yeah. The, so the whole, the whole idea is, um, the whole thing about it is, or the whole scene behind it is, there was more up there than just gold. Sure. So the idea is, yes, there was gold up there, um, but there was also demon coyotes and Indian spirits and things that would kill you. Sure. Um, and the idea for that came out a long time ago, but. The whole thing was the, uh, the the Native Americans that were there, the Kosovo Native Americans, um, all, everybody that's there is trying to hire them to show them where the gold is. Right. And so when he gets involved with all this, he was like, where's the gold? And the girl you know, who kind of he falls for as part of this, she's trying to assassinate somebody. Oh, wow. <laughs> she goes, we know where all the gold is because we put it there to keep this demon at bay. Oh, wow. That's the only way to keep this demon is to bury the gold on top of them. And as you all keep picking it up, you're unleashing it. Oh, you know interesting. I mean? So that's, that's the Foster Brassard. The Foster Brassard Demons of the Gold Rush. Okay, nice. Yeah. Well, there you have it. Yeah. Uh, another IP coming out. Uh, is that also under the uh, Red Five yeah. comics? No, no, that was, that was just... Under your own? Mm-hmm. Okay, very cool. Words and art, yeah. Okay. They're working um, on it, though. They they, they, they kind of work for me. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Good. There you have it. Um, this has been your wow factor... Thank you, Trevor, for coming absolutely, in and, and, and being great. with us. You can, uh, um, absolutely. Go to your local comic book shop. We can't say that enough here at, at Comic Wow. Go to your local comic book shop. Support your local comic book shop. If you do not know where one is, go to uh, comicshoplocator.com. Mm-hmm. Put in your zip code. It'll show you with the nearest one near you. Go there. Check them out. Become part of the comic community, uh, pop there's culture. One, there's one in our county where I live. I forget what they're called, but... I go there and say, oh, how's the business? Say, we sell a lot of books. Right. And I'm like, wow, okay. Well, you selling Cliff Bari? He said, not yet, but we're going to order it. They absolutely should. They will. And if you are a comic book store watching this, please make sure that this is on your shelf. Yep. Because uh, post-Netflix, it's 
uh, and it's already going to be hot. It already was hot. Let's keep it. Let's keep it burning. Absolutely, man. All right. I appreciate uh, it. Absolutely. Thank you very <laughs> much, Trevor. Absolutely. And we'll see you guys next time. And um, lastly, go to previewsworld.com for all of your comic book news and information. That's where you're going to find what's coming out at your local comic book shop up to three months in advance. I'm Rick, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.